guys so welcome to uh, on the operation operational excellence um so um if you look at where we are um uh, we are following the uh, asia well architected framework so we have few pillars cost op optimization operational excellence performance efficiency reliability uh, and security so what we are focusing today is basically about operational uh, excellence so operational excellence is basically about uh, uh, it's basically what is required to keep an application running in production so this talks about deployment uh, automation and all those things so today i'm specifically focusing on the first three uh, like mentioned uh, uh, the application design monitoring and the application performance management so and the application design um, mainly i'll be talking about uh, uh, how to deploy infrastructure via code um, iac uh, like arn templates and so on um, then i'll be looking into cost uh, aspect of this as well and and also giving uh, a little um, uh, uh, insight into uh, kubernetes, uh, kubernetes uh, dockerization containerization and so on and in terms of monitoring uh, uh, this is basically about uh, we will look at um, what are the recommended uh, application monitoring uh, support available in asia uh, for health uh, diagnostics and all related uh, log information and so on uh, then i also want to briefly touch about uh, touch on um, application performance management this is basically to do with uh, devops and um, basically about some of the best practices in implementing uh, proper ci cd pipelines um yeah so that's that's what i'm trying to cover today uh, so we have a limited amount of time uh, and the i know these are very broad topics so uh, what i thought was mainly i'll uh, talk things in overview uh, mainly about theory uh, and also i'll uh, whenever I can show you some uh, sample code or something, I can I can do that. Um, and guys, please uh, ask questions uh, from me. Otherwise, I think I'll I'll just finish this in 20 minutes or so. All right. Okay. So with that, uh, let's move on to application design. Um, so basically, uh, like I said earlier, um, this is about uh, building and designing. Uh, a proper application and uh, and um, orchestrate workloads with DevOps pipelines. So um, let's look at that. And I first want to start talking about uh, infrastructure as a code. So um, what this basically means is uh, like um, I mean, when you apart from the the code that you write, what you, in an on-premise environment you will typically use uh, and use a let's say sql server which is already there or use an application server like iis or something which is already there to deploy your application uh, but uh, if you can also script the infrastructure part as well um, it makes things so much easier so this is what iac is about um so it's about management of infrastructure in a descriptive model um which means that you would actually script uh, the infrastructure part of your application as well so this is becoming very relevant these days with uh, with cloud applications because if it was on premise uh, it was a local setup but with cloud applications with all the the cloud resources which are available to you um, it kind of makes sense if you can actually deploy this uh, automatically as well um, so that you can replicate it easier. So um, with IAC, deployment is fully automated and um, idem important. So what this means is basically uh, once it's scripted, you can repeat the same, same thing over and over again and it produces the same results. So um, so imagine that you have a dev environment and a test environment and a production environment. Um, and if they are hosted, uh, if they're on-premise, 
and if you want to update let's say the sql version of one envi in environment you will probably have to do that three times uh, but if you have that uh, in code you, it's just a matter of updating the code uh, and run it uh, three times so everything is much easier so in asia um, you basically have two main uh, solutions for this um, the first thing is arm templates uh, and you also have terraform so um, there are differences between these two and i think what is applicable what is right for you is is a is basically depends on your need um, uh, ARM is basically Asia resource management templates. Uh, they are JSON based uh, templates. So they are they are the ones that uh, Microsoft sort of uh, recommends out of the box. Um, and if you compare that with Terraform, Terraform is more of an open uh, open uh, what do you call platform independent thing. And it uses uh, HCL um, scripting uh, language known as HCL to um, to write down the infrastructure requirements so and this is uh, i mean especially if you're familiar with i mean if you're coming from like an aws background or so uh, this is platform independent so they use the same thing uh, you can use the same thing there as well um another advantage uh, i see with terraform is that uh, when it comes to validation uh, things are a little easier there um so because um, um uh, Terraform actually supports pre-validation, so you can actually write your uh, script um, and then you can validate it before deployment and ARM does not uh, support that as of yet. Uh, but however, with uh, ARM being a Microsoft technology, there's so much better integration into the uh, Asian network. So it's also um, back and forth there. Uh, my recommendation is uh, um, go with arm first and if there's something that you can't uh, uh, handle with arm then look at terraform because arm uh, is evolving so i think eventually it will get there uh, we will look at uh, some of the um, uh, in, in my next slide i have a sample arm template so i can just discuss this in detail uh, <clears throat> And uh, so this is basically known as a declarative approach where you can you basically use script uh, in the sense whatever you need, you write down these are the things that you need uh, in the template. Uh, so that's a declarative approach. And then uh, you can also use uh, as an imperative approach, you can use PowerShell and the Asia CL, CLI scripts. So basically in Asia, if you want to uh, create resources, there are three ways of doing that. The first and obvious way is basically you can use the portal and you can manually do it yourself. Then the next step is basically this imperative approach. Uh, it's still automated. You can script what you So you basically run a uh, write a PowerShell script and uh, you know you just run the script and it will deploy the, uh, the, the needed ones. And you can actually even uh, connect that to the pipeline so that it's automatically triggered. And then the declarative approach that once what we are talking about today is basically about uh, the Terraform and the ARM templates. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so to um, um, yeah, so you can uh, use the DevOps services, Jenkins, so at the CI/CD pipelines to do the actual deployment part of it. So you write uh, whatever you want in your script, and you use uh, DevOps to uh, make the actual deployment um, all right so this is basically a, a sample so i thought i can maybe take two minutes and just go through this um, if anyone hasn't seen these before then i think it'll be advantageous um, so uh, what i have here is on your on your left uh, i have the variable declaration uh, so i'm trying to be um, um, this is basically here and here is uh, Two parts of the same file. It's a. It's called the template file. So I'm trying to deploy a SQL server uh, here, um, and I'm particularly interested about this addition part. So I'm here. I'm declaring a variable, and I'm saying uh, uh, addition allowed values are basic, premium, standards. This is like a template. Uh, default is basic, and it's a 
the string type uh, variable. And here I'm attaching that to the SQL server where I'm trying to sort of uh, uh, create uh, an SQL server. Here you see uh, um, locations and other resources as well. Uh, you don't need to go too much into detail, but what I'm trying to say here is if I look right here, um, this is actually called a parameter file where I can use one of these templates and run it against the parameter file. So this is my um, uh, development parameter file where I use uh, this template along with this parameter file when I want to deploy something to my development environment. So you can see the environment is dev. And in dev, I use uh, standard tier uh, edition. Uh, but in my production, uh, I can use the same template file with a separate parameter file. I can say production and maybe I can use a premium one here. So this is the important part where I don't have to rewrite everything again. I just use a different set of parameters and run the same template. Um, and uh, also um, just uh, have a look at these tags and so on. Uh, I'll talk about this, that in detail. And you can also say that um, uh, here actually I'm deploying a database and he, uh, it says it depends on the server uh, and so on the locations and so on uh, because you, you can have things like depends on tags and so on. Uh, let's look at that in detail. So, um, yeah, so this is what I was talking about. Um, so here you can actually use child resources, things like depends on to sort of create uh, whatever you need. So the idea here is that uh, you cannot de deploy a database without a database server. So you de uh, declare the database server and in your database, in your database uh, declaration, you would have a depends on to your server. So it sort of establishes this hierarchy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and one thing is uh, you do have your resource limits um, and you have to, I mean, with your subscription, it gives you resource limits. And when you're doing a thing like that, this, uh, something to watch out is your resource limits. Um, and, and tagging of resources, we looked at tagging earlier in the sample. Um, so, Tagging is basically a, a way of management or way of um, attributing resources. Um, so advantage of tagging is later on, you can categorize things per tag. I mean, it's like a hashtag basically. So let's say you have a portfolio of applications. You can tag certain databases and certain resources with uh, application A and application B, so on. So for example, when the, when let's say you get the, uh, the cost, when you compare the cost, you can easily filter it by the tag. So you know that for application A, you, you're spending this much monthly and B and for this much and so on. Um, yeah, so there is another term that I think we often talk about is workloads. Uh, workloads is basically a unit of functionality. Um, it basically encompasses all the things which are needed to perform a transaction or perform an operation. So, so basically, if you have one process, uh, let's say um, um, uh, one operation, um, you will have resources that you need. So all of that you sort of encompasses into a workload. This is a logical terminology. The idea here is that especially uh, when you're sort of migrating, imagine in your uh, in in uh, on on uh, hosted environment and you're migrating into Asia or something like that. You try to uh, uh, one approach of migration is you try to migrate one workload at a time. So I just put it there because this is also, it'll come up later on as well, but that's also something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, yeah, so that's basically about uh, uh, infrastructure as a code. Um, so the idea here is it's a simplicity, it's a ease of use. 
um, I mean, something that we you don't often necessarily do on a on hosted environment, but uh, with the cloud environment, you have the option of using or rather scripting the infrastructure that you need as well. Um, yeah, so I want to move into containerization as well. Um, we talked about a lot of things right now. Uh, what guys, any questions? Hello, are you guys there? Yes, All right, okay. So uh, just stop me anytime. Like I said earlier, I think if you guys ask questions, I can go into detail on these things. So I want to talk about uh, containerization. So um, containerization is basically um, is, is a term borrowed by the shipping industry. Um, so the idea here is basically uh, back in the day uh, before the, this 40 foot containers came in, people used to ship the items as they are. Like if you're shipping a car, you ship the car as it is. If you're shipping a bed, you ship the bed as it is. So when you do that, the logistics become a nightmare. So, um, I mean, you would want, I um, mean, imagine a shipping company transporting your cars and uh, beds and TVs and whatnot. You would need different uh, ways of unloading them and loading them, so on. It's a, it becomes a nightmare. So the idea here is that uh, uh, you you invent uh, basically you have containers, uh, which is basically an agreed standard, uh, and the contain uh, the cranes in the port and the ships and everything is designed to uh, store these containers. So you can basically take a container ship whatever you want to uh, ship within that container and whatever you do inside the container is your 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 thing you do that and uh, once it is in the container once it's the container seal then the shipping company can manage easily uh, all the logistics the trucks even the trucks on the road and everything is designed for that container so that's the same basic idea um, that we have uh, here and uh, when it comes to containerization, um, uh, Asia has Asia container instances. Uh, then uh, AWS has uh, Elastic Container Services, Google Container Engine, and everything. Uh, but they're all using Docker inside. So Docker is a well-known platform. Um, so, so container is something, I mean, if you're familiar with v VMs, I think VMs are the ones which are often compared to uh, it provides virtualization. And um, <clears throat> the idea behind containerization is uh, whatever is needed uh, <coughs> to run your application, you bundle that into the container so that the container can run independently. So the container, if you take a container, it will run independently. Uh, you don't need any supporting um you know infrastructure or anything it will just run independently so whatever to achieve that independency you have bundled so many things into that container so that's the idea behind containerization so we'll look at this in the next slide as well and it's very lightweight uh, compared to a virtual machine and since it's lightweight uh, you can quickly swap in and swap out containers uh, and docker is integrated into asia um, so if you, let's look at these two diagrams. Um, so on your left, uh, this is the the difference between uh, a VM and a container. Um, so VM, if you look at VM, you have the physical server and uh, physical server hypervisor, and then you have uh, on top of the hypervisor you have separate VM. So these are like machines. You need the host operating system and your applications run on top of it. The difference between VMs and containers is that containers run on the same VM kernel. So you don't have a separate operating system per container. What is there is you on the OS, you you have your container engine. Um, Docker is what we use here, but you can it could be Docker, it could you can use anything. Uh, and then containers run on top of your container engine. So you can install a container service uh, in your computer as well, in your laptops as well. Um, and then uh, it'll take care of the container 
uh, running containers part. So that's the main idea. And since um, uh, we don't have an OS and you don't have all the other things uh, in the container, they are lightweight. Uh, and because it's lightweight, it's faster, it's easier to swap and all these things. Uh, <coughs> so that's the basic uh, idea behind VMs and containers. And if you look at the Docker architecture on the right, um, let me quickly go through this as well. So basically, Docker is a client server architecture. Uh, so your client is where everyone connects to and you can run your Docker commands. Um, so everything Docker uh, starts with Docker, Docker build, Docker pull, and so on. And then you have your Docker host. Um, and here um, you see you can run, you have your container. So you can build and you can suck up your containers. It will be there. So the containers uh, use images. So image is something like a template. So let's say that you want uh, um, an SQL server um running on windows uh, 10. Um, if you want that you can get that image and build your application on top of it and you can put it in as your com container so that's the basic idea and on on the far right you have the registry uh, this is where basically the container images and everything are registered and and publicly you can use docker hub which is like a very good collection of uh, images or you can actually even have your own uh, uh, image registry as well so if you want to let's say if you come to if you look at start from here if you want to create uh, a container you can uh, fetch um, for an image uh, so if the image is here already it'll just give you or if not it'll basically download from docker hub or whatever the registry that you have configured uh, then you have the Docker daemon. Docker daemon is like the uh, the central point uh, here, um, and it's the one basically which communicates with the client. And if you have multiple hosts, it will uh, communicate with other Docker daemons as well. Um, I think uh, yeah. So this is what is known as Docker D as well. Um, that is like a main controller there. Um, yeah. So that's basically the the Docker part of it. Um, I want to move on to um, the orchestration part of it. Um, so just stop me if you have questions. Um, yeah, so OK, so. Um, so. Um, so so the. Um, uh, to run containers, um, the idea here is that uh, if you have couple of containers you probably don't need an orchestration mechanism but if you have thousands of containers you would actually need a mechanism to manage this and that is what is known as orchestration so there is uh, yeah so um, so it's basically the task of automating and managing many containers that's what is known as orchestration so there is this uh, concept of integration and orchestration. So integration is basically the communication between containers. Um, and orchestration, if you look at orchestration, uh, this is again a term borrowed by uh, the music industry. Uh, when you have an opera, um, you have bass players, uh, you have the bass, uh, um, you have the, uh, the trebles and the, the, do, uh, the people who are singing and everything. But uh, orchestrator is basically the one who sort of harmon sort of gets everyone uh, to manage this, so that in the end you create a harmony. So that's the same idea here as well. Um, so um, uh, let's look at uh, that also a little bit. And um, yeah, so. Let's look at this actually. Uh, so Asia recommends Age AKS, uh, Asia Kubernetes service for this. Um, again, um, you can use anything you want. Um, but um, if you look at this one, um, if you look at a basic architecture behind this, you can run a uh, Kubernetes on your computer as well. Um, if you on a virtual machine or on your machine as well, 
So it basically has two main uh, uh, components, uh, the, the master um, and the cluster nodes. So the master is basically uh, the controlling part of it. And if you use AKS, you get uh, Asia managed uh, uh, master free of charge. So you don't need to worry about that. So um, if I just talk about this briefly, um, on your managed node or rather or in your master node, uh, you have four components, um, um, API service, ETCD, control manager, and the scheduler. So ETCD is basically, um, it's something uh, which is there to manage the, or to maintain the status. Um, that's about it. Um, and um, API is basically for communication and the control manager controls the entire thing. On your customer, uh, sorry, on your, uh, 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 on your uh, cluster nodes, um, they, all, they can be known as pods as well. Uh, again, you have four components. So what is, I guess, mostly familiar is kubelets. This is basically the shell. So if you have used um, Kubernetes earlier, everything comes with uh, cube something, cube something. So that is the shell there. So, and then uh, you have the cube proxy here. Cube proxy is basically um, what connects your VNet. Or oh, basically that is, the, that is the mechanism in which the, uh, the network aspects are maintained in. Um, here, I think this is a family instance. Uh, you have the, the container runtime and the containers. We saw, just saw that earlier. Um, so uh, you can have your containers and it uses the container runtime to run it. So what happens is when you connect to kubelets, um, it's, it can communicate it with the scheduler here. Uh, and it uses API services uh, to communicate with, if you want to communicate with a different uh, node, uh, contain a different node, you can do so like that. Um, yeah, so that's the basic idea of um, um, AKS. And um, and yeah, the second point is basically about you can sort of uh, associate this with your CICD environment so that uh, the deployments and everything is easy. So you can basically get the CI, uh, DevOps to deploy your uh, clusters as well. Um, and if you look at why you want to sort of use these containers and container or orchestration is basically uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. I mean, main idea behind this is uh, this. If you compare this into a with a virtual machine, um, which is uh, the other type of virtualization. Um, yeah, and th these are very lightweight things. So when it comes to Asia, which means which will actually translate into cost saving. And since it's lightweight, since it's lightweight, it's it also means that uh, uh, spawning up uh, these things, everything is faster. So this uh, you can pop up a container or this thing in ten seconds and compare this to a virtual machine scaling up, which will take much more than that. So um, cost is a huge factor, obviously, uh, when it uh, when you run uh, um, cloud services. Um, and it can help you in uh, performance as well. And the other reason is uh, this is a universal, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, paradigm of uh, coding uh, or programming. Uh, it's platform independent. Uh, you can get this to run on Linux servers. You can get this to run on anything. So there's that, that aspect as well. So with that, uh, that's the main things that I wanted to discuss when it comes to uh, uh, application design. Um, so we talked about uh, um, ARN templates, Terraform, and um, um, basically the concept of writing infrastructure as code and also the benefits of that uh, we also touched upon i guess uh, the tagging aspects and so on related to that so those are like the devops side 
um then um, i guess we briefly touched upon um, the containerization and container or orchestration also in application design um yeah so that's that's actually it when it comes to application design um so if i move on to the second uh, thing which is about monitoring um here i want to talk about uh, the the recommended approach of approaches of application monitoring but guys seriously uh, do you guys have any questions i feel like i have been talking a lot all right so i take that as a no oh do you, someone had question um all right so let me move on then um so when it comes to monitoring um i guess one thing the 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 most uh, i think we are all familiar with application insights so i don't want to spend too much time on application insights but i do want to talk about uh, some of the benefits it offers just in case that you have missed some of these things so um so most of us use application enable application insights and as you enable it uh, you have a very, this very nice out of the box dashboard uh, that actually covers a lot of information as it is so um, so that's a that's a very good starting point with that um, it also can monitor performance usage uh, and it also has this uh, uh, nice tool the application map where uh, application insights analyzes uh, the dependencies so if the if the if you if you one of your services depend on a api or something like that it sort of uh, analyzes that and that can be helpful especially um, if there's a bottleneck or something and if you want to find out where it is this is a nice tool um, that you can use um, and it has smart detection uh, where it sort of try to sort of tell you uh, where the issues are uh release annotations are basically uh, um it can tag uh, when you do a deployment it can uh, it tags these releases so if your application is suddenly slow suddenly misbehaving or something you can easily track it back to a, a tag release tag it make would make your life much easier uh and when it uh, snapshot debugging debuggers are basically um, when it when something comes uh, it sort of preserves the debugging information which you can use later on um and then i'm i think you guys have used this versus code based monitoring uh, codeless is basically you don't do anything uh, it sort of gets the uh, information from the environment when you're running the application code based monitoring is you can actually send information from your code to application inside if it's this so the idea here is that if it's uh, if it's generic information uh, it's the codeless aspect it'll just take care of it but if it's if there are application specific information that you want to pass to application insights then you you just so, sort of specify that in the code itself um having said that um what asia recommends is to use the asia monitor so asia monitor is basically is like a bigger brother where it sort of monitors everything so um uh it sort of monitors the entire landscape like the entire infrastructure everything it monitors uh it even uh, 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 supports on premise monitoring so you can actually install an agent and it can sort of use grab that information uh, into asia monitor so and it uses uh, i mean it does platform and container monitoring as well so it has container insights as well let's look at that in detail um, <coughs> yeah so on your left you see the sources in which this application uh asia monitor collects information from so basically you have um, um asia platform services so these are like the sign on activities uh, 
um, activity logs, resource logs, etc. Um, then you have the infrastructure um, where you sort of these are basically compute uh, services. Um, and if you have VMs, you can run an, like I said earlier, you can run a, run a VM uh, agent on the VM um, and on prem and so on. So you can get infrastructure information as well. Then you can obviously get application information as well, application insights that we talked about. Apart from that, you can, it also supports custom sources. You can sort of basically plug in anything you want uh, to be monitored by Asia Monitor. So it captures this information and then it sort of uh, keeps this information in two data sources, matrices and logs. Um, matrices are kind of time series information. Uh, so um, it's it's like an abstracted information uh, um, where um, um, that you can use it for triggers and stuff like that. Uh, uh, whereas logs, uh, if you look at logs, these are more detailed logs. So it sort of uses uh, both of these. And uh, when it comes to logs, uh, you can use a query language to sort of go through the logs. So this is how it stores uh, information. And what is most interesting here is how this information is presented and what you can do with that. Um, so it basically has few levels of uh, things that you can do. Um, the, the first thing, the most obvious thing that most of us use is insights. So application insights, we saw that. And I guess pretty much you guys have used that. You have container insights, uh, networks insta insights, um, virtual machine information storage. So you can see all of that information. This is basically about, uh, uh, you know, like it says that um, it's all use that uh, presents that information. Um, and then you have uh, um, <clears throat> the analyze part where you can sort of analyze this information. These are all provided uh, in Asia itself. Um, and so you have the matrix explorer. Again, uh, it's connected to this one. You, you have tools to explore matrices. Uh, and then you have the log analytics to analyze that information. Uh, when it comes to visualizing, uh, uh, this is where the information is presented to you. Um, so you have dashboards. You've seen that, I guess, in uh, App Insights. Um, then you have um, workbooks. Uh, workbook, workbooks are basically, um, I would say, a little bit of an interactive version of the dashboard. Um, yeah, so those are sort of things that you can do here. And then um, the other thing is uh, once you have information, um, you can respond to that information as well. So, uh, so the first thing is you can have alerts. Um, so, for example, if uh, um, uh, a resource utilization is reaching 95%, you can set it to send a message to your phone or something. Uh, e send an email or something. And um, so basically everyone gets informed. Uh, you can have auto scaling rules again if the, let's say a virtual machine is hitting 90% uh, utilization then you can basically have a auto scaling rule to scale out have another instance uh, running um, then you can also set different actions uh, based on this uh, so that is an overview of uh, asia monitor it's a quite a powerful tool um, so why monitoring is so important is that uh, in Asia, mostly you pay uh, as you go, you pay for what you use, right? So if your information or rather if your uh, resources are not correctly uh, used or if they're not utilized, uh, you pay uh, more than what you actually need to pay. So something like this can actually help you find out whether get an idea about your utilization, where you need to invest more in future and so on. Uh, obviously, it will help you when it, when things go south as well. Uh, 
apart from um, application monitor, uh, you also have uh, network watch. Uh, this is basically, as the name suggests, uh, it's uh, everything to do with uh, net uh, networking. So it's it has traffic analytics. Um, and it it basically can detect malicious IPs as well. It uses this um, uh, threat intelligence database, uh, Microsoft Threat Intelligence Database. So it can sort of um, sort of detect uh, and attack uh, as well. Uh, so it and it can give you uh, information about uh, your connections and VPNs as well. So this is also something that you can just keep in your mind uh, if your application is uh, very network heavy something that you can use. <coughs> so uh, not directly related to monitoring, but some of the other information is uh, activity logs are very helpful. Um, you have query tools to go through activity logs, use them. Um, then you also have the Azure service health dashboards. So, so this is uh, not your application, but this is giving, um, this is basically, uh, giving health about Asia resources, like either whether the um, the queues are working, um, whether there are issues with a certain region and so on. So um, that is also a helpful tool that you can keep in mind if, uh, if, if there is an issue, I think one of the first things that you need to watch is whether there's an issue, uh, uh, whether there's an Asia issue on a, on a particular type of resource that you're using. Um, Asia Advisor, this is a very powerful tool. I personally have used this tool. Uh, when you log into Asia portal, you have the Asia Advisor. Uh, so it's on the left. Uh, if you just search for it, it goes there. So it, it actually does a smart detection of your resource pool. Uh, it analyzes your resources over time and it gives you certain suggestions to improve performance and to cut down costs. Uh, so this is very helpful, guys. Um, just uh, just search for Asia Advice on your portal. Um, if, you, if you don't do this, uh, just have a have a have a sort of a regular task to look at the Asia Advisor at least once a month or so. It gives you amazing suggestions. Um, then, um, yeah, Asia Security Center is also some um, thing that you can use. Uh, so um, this uh, sort of uh, tells you whether uh, a particular Asia resource is correctly configured in terms of security. <laughs> um, yeah, so what is most, I mean, you have these tools. What is important is uh, how to use them. Um, so best practices in using this is uh, basically the first thing is you need to create meaningful customer dashboards, uh, custom dashboards. Um, so you have these tools uh, apart from out of the box dashboards, define custom dashboards, define the things that you want. Um, sharing is important. These dashboards can be easily shared across. Uh, you can set permissions and so on, um, no problem. Uh, uh, and uh, if you don't want, um, uh, I mean, when it comes to security concerns with GDPR and all, if you don't want certain people to access to logs where it contains sensitive information, you can prevent that. But uh, get your configuration right, but share it with the relevant people so that people have access to it. Uh, use notifications, use email notifications, use SMS notifications. Uh, use uh, the notification so that uh, when things go south, um, everyone uh, gets informed quickly. Use automation, use scaling rules, uh, uh, use triggers, um, use what you what is there. Um, and, and also keep an eye on subscription limits. Uh, so, I mean, there are tiers in your resources. Um, when it comes to database, you'll have database premier tiers and so on. Uh, keep an eye, eye out for that. Uh, what you're using, monitoring can help you that, with that. And another thing that you often forget is about uh, the certificates. Uh, keep an eye out about the uh, expiration of certificates. This has happened to me personally. Um, something like <laughs> not renewing a certificate can 
mess things up quite easily. Um, yes, so that's uh, about monitoring. Um, and I want to touch uh, a little bit. I won't take much time, but I want to talk about performance uh, of deployment infrastructure as well. So some of the best practices. Um, again, I'm asking uh, before I move on, if you guys have any questions, uh, we can even take it now or you can even ask at the end of the session. I take it that you don't have questions, so I'll move on. Um, so one of the things uh, when it comes to uh, uh, your uh, CI um, DevOps infrastructure is uh, you can look at um, improving build times. So the build times and the deployment times and how you use it uh, can also be a uh, little challenging because if your infrastructure takes forever, you might have a good uh, CICD pipeline, but if your infrastructure and everything gets forever to build, it will not be effective. So then, I mean, let's say if your PR build takes four hours, no one is gonna wait until four hours uh, just to see whether what they have done is right or wrong. So these are things that you need to sort of, uh, especially if your team is, uh, if you have a big team, you need to focus on this. So uh, one thing is you can use the hosted agent. Um, so that is easy, easy configuration. Uh, so, <coughs> when it comes to build a, building uh, prop, using proper DevOps uh, mechanism, um, what is recommended is to use the hosted agent. And if you're not using hosted agent, uh, I think it's important to figure out the right virtual machine size for the building, uh, for the build environment. Um, right size to give enough performance and not to waste too much of money. Uh, you can also scale out build servers um, as you would scale out your other infrastructure. Um, and other thing is, uh, one thing that we typically ignore is build server location is also quite important. Um, so when it comes to building, there is a lot of copying operation is going on. Like it will download the uh, source, it will build it and it will package it, uh, it'll move it to a different server, deploy it and so on. So when you sort of try to do that across uh, geographical locations, so if your source control uh, is server is in US and you, if your uh, build server is in Sri Lanka and you will deploy it in uh, Japan or something like that, that actually takes significant uh, toll on time as well. <laughs> and uh, you can use parallelization. Um, you can use parallel jobs. Uh, and also when it comes to test execution, uh, your unit test, uh, your automation tests, use parallel execution. This is something that most of us don't do. Um, so this can help you uh, with times, especially when it comes to uh, uh, very time consuming uh, automated testing. Um, but uh, it's not just as enabling this uh, uh, unit test. Of course, uh, it's not a problem uh, because it tests the unit, so you can run it in parallel, no problem. But when it comes to more sophisticated tests like integration tests, so or especially automated tests, uh, running things, running tests in parallel is something that you have to design uh, from the get go. So keep that in mind as well. And uh, the last thing that I want to touch is about uh, different builds. Uh, what kind of builds uh, that you need to run. So uh, I think uh, what is recommended is to have a PR build, um, a CI build, uh, which is sort of lightweight that you can run frequently. So this is basically what I talked about earlier. Uh, when people commit code, it run, needs to run uh, continuously and it needs to run frequently. So if this is taking four hours, no one is going to wait for this. So if you want to, I mean, if you, for example, if your automated tests are taking long, 
you can actually isolate the automated test out of this. Uh, you can just have the most uh, basic tests uh, and the especially and the uh, uh, sort of uh, sonar cloud and static code analysis and so on here. Uh, that should be good enough. But if you do that, uh, think about a nightly build. Uh, whatever you can't run it in the PR build, like um, the heavy automated uh, tests, uh, if you're generating any reports and so on, if you can't run it in the PR build, uh, have a nightly build and uh, have the uh, statistics available uh, uh, the next day morning or something like that. So where the team has to be disciplined enough, uh, even though their PR build is passing, if the nightly build is failing, uh, the, the team has to be disciplined enough to have a look at it and uh, um, sort of iron out those issues. And then you can obviously have a production build, a manual trigger, um, which will actually release into your production. Um, so this is basically the recommendation uh, when it comes to uh, having different builds and so on. Uh, so that's actually it, what I had to discuss for today. Uh...